good afternoon. Um, I am Senator Mark Udall uh, from the state, the great state, the Centennial State uh, of Colorado, and we're all pleased that uh, you're here. I want to thank Senator Grassley, uh, Congressman McNerney, and Congressman Steve King, who hasn't joined us, but we hope he'll be here soon. They're each going to speak uh, in a few minutes. Uh, it's an honor to stand side by side with each of you uh, in support of the production tax credit for wind. It's a truly bipartisan and bicameral cause, as evidenced just by the, the view you have of the members of the House and Senate. I also want to thank Operation Free and the veterans who are here today. Uh, Operation Free, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a nationwide coalition of veterans and national security experts working to secure America with clean energy. And there, some of those uh, great veterans are joining us up here. Um, we've got 40 veterans, uh, three of whom are from my home state of Colorado. They're here for a two-day fly-in. Uh, they're meeting with more than 45 congressional offices to tell them what we're all here to say as well. Don't delay. Extend the wind PTC. The wind industry uh, employs uh, thousands of Americans and provides strong middle-class job opportunities for our men and women in uniform returning home. The wind energy industry makes a natural fit for veterans uh, because of the specialized skill sets that they possess. Uh, we're all here because we recognize that energy security is national security. We can't project strength abroad if we're weak economically here at home. And transitioning to alternative forms of energy right here in America improves our economy. I think you're all here because you know in that spirit, wind energy is one of the fastest growing energy sources in the United States. But those gains are truly at risk if we don't extend the production tax credit. And already over the past several months, we've seen the real life effects of Congress's failure to quickly extend what is a common sense tax credit. Uh, if you think about it, it's a tax credit that's directed after those electrons are produced. It's not a speculative tax credit. It's not based on good behavior, but it's based on actually producing electrons that we use here. I mentioned uh, some of the effects of not extending the PTC, um, and I want to direct uh, uh, your attention to the home state of Colorado. Many of the factories that make the towers, the blades, the nacelles, and the many other components in wind turbines, some 8,000 parts go into a wind turbine, uh, these factories announced layoffs due to the uncertainty over the PTC. For me, enough is enough. Uh, these layoffs should be a wake-up call uh, for all of our colleagues who oppose extending the PTC or are content to just let it uh, lapse. Uh, Operation Free, in conjunction with the American Wind Energy Association, asked veterans across the country how they feel about wind energy, and they responded. Uh, we've got a petition. I think over here that I want to draw your attention to that reflects uh, their po uh, point of view. It's been signed by more than 3,000 veterans asking us to extend the wind PTC. And as I mentioned, there are three Colorado veterans who've flown all the way here to D.C. Uh, to speak out on behalf of these 3,000 names. Those three Coloradans are uh, Devlin Messmer, who's from Lamar, Michael Gretchen of Denver, and Samuel Tasker of Sterling. Uh, our veterans understand what's at stake. We must act now to support the wind industry and secure our energy future and energy jobs. Uh, the PTC supports American manufacturing and made in America energy. And the PTC provides the same kind of support other energy sources have received throughout the history of our country. By the way, we're really excited about the natural gas reservoirs we've identified. Natural gas has been a beneficiary of a production tax credit uh, in, in, in the past. So I'm. Truly here, though, really to uh, tell you how honored I am to stand beside uh, my friend and uh, fellow senator, Senator Grassley, um, following one of my first speeches to the U.S. Senate on the PTC. I've now delivered uh, 22 speeches uh, on the PTC. Uh, senator Grassley, after I gave one of those speeches, replied that he had no idea two, de two decades ago that the PCC would be such a big idea and, or, and a big deal. I want to thank him for his leadership on the issue. And with that, I want to hand over the microphone to the father of the wind production tax credit, Senator Charles Grassley. Chuck. Well, after 20 years, that may be a grandfather. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, for Senator Udall, for your leadership in this area. 
And I was going to acknowledge all the speeches you've given, but you already spoke to that. But I thank you for speaking out so often on this. And I'm also happy to be here with veterans. Uh, I think a year or two ago, there was a similar uh, group that came to town uh, I interested in this issue as well. And I have at least two from the state of Iowa here because I know they're on my schedule for this afternoon. Uh, one from Newton and one from Esterville, and I thank you very much uh, for uh, your involvement with this and, and veterans, and more importantly, thank the veterans for their service to our country. Uh, this incentive for wind energy is working, obviously, by the amount of electricity we generate, the jobs that were created, and as Senator Udall said, I never uh, uh, thought in terms of when I uh, got this legislation passed that Iowa would be number two in wind energy production and all the jobs we'd have. And we also have those layoffs as Senator Leahy talked about. So this incentive is working and should be a part of the effort in Washington to help us get more Americans, in particular showing our appreciation to the veterans uh, getting uh, these jobs back and creating more jobs. Now, the issue of certainty is very important, and tax policy and energy policy has to have some certainty. So whether it's tax policy or about affordable energy, uh, it's an essential factor for economic growth. People have to plan. They have to know what the policies is out there and make plans accordingly. And as much energy uh, as possible, both traditional and renewable, should be produced at home to create jobs and strengthen our national security. It's stupid to be importing as much oil as we do and spending as much as we do and uh, shipping those dollars overseas to do harm in some ways uh, to our, even to our national security. The good news is that legislation in the House of Representatives to extend the production tax credit for wind has 118 co-sponsors, and that's both Republican and Democrat. In August, the Senate Finance Committee, with bipartisan support, passed an extension of the wind energy production uh, tax credit. This extension deserves a place in a year-end package of tax extenders to help give confidence and certainty to investors uh, and to employers uh, need to keep uh, and hire workers. There's no reason to exacerbate the unemployment problem by failing to extend this successful tax incentive, and particularly with 20 years of investment in this and uh, accomplishment resulting therefrom, it ought to be pretty clear that if it's just going to take a few more years to make this a, a mature industry, we should not uh, throw away what's already be, been invested. And America's economic and national security, uh, in short and the long term, depends on the robust efforts to develop domestic energy sources. A clean, renewable source like wind is not dependent on faraway countries with leaders who are hostile to the United States even as they take our energy dollars. Thank you very much, and thank you once again, Senator Udall, Senator McNerney, and Senator King. Thank you as well. You just demoted them, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for the promotion. <clears throat> Did I say Senator King? Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank the uh, Truman Project for its leadership in organizing this event today uh, to get the message out there about how important the production tax credit is. I want to thank my good friend, uh, Mark Udall, for his uh, unending leadership in, in this issue in renewable energy, how important that is. Uh, I want to thank my colleague Stephen King for coming and speaking out uh, on behalf of the business. Uh, I spent 25 years in the industry before coming to Congress. I saw it start from the very early designs that didn't last more than a few months uh, and uh, to uh, making bigger gears and, 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 uh, and foundations and aerodynamics. Uh, tremendous advances were made in all these technical fields, electronics, uh, until today, we have windmills that are absolute uh, works of art. Uh, they stand hundreds of feet tall. Uh, they're extremely reliable. They're very cost economic. They're very cost uh, uh, competitive. Uh, and so it's a tremendous industry. It's a tremendous business. Uh, and our country uh, is and should be a, a leader in this business. Now, one of the things that happens when uh, there's uncertain policies like this production tax credit, it comes and it goes. Uh, these wind turbine projects take years uh, to, to get in place. There's years of lead time. You have to have 
Uh, you have to have the permits, you have to have power purchase agreements, you need financing, and then you can start ordering parts. Uh, parts take 18 months to get. You're talking about gear, uh, gears and, uh, and, and uh, bearings that are 10 feet in diameter. Uh, when wind turbines operate, they have more inertia than any other object on the earth. Uh, so uh, this is a very big undertaking to make windmills, uh, tremendous lead time. Uh, and if you don't have the certainty of, of a production tax credit or a consistent policy, nobody will make these investments. Uh, the, wind, uh, the wind turbine industry will, will go away. And we've seen that. I've seen that happen uh, in my 25-year career. Uh, the industry would, would suffer tremendous setbacks. Companies would go out of business. People would be laid off. And that's exactly what's happening right now. Uh, there's at least 40,000 jobs, direct jobs at risk, uh, if we don't pass a production tax credit. So uh, that's a huge challenge. Uh, some of these uh, firms, like the Airstream, uh, trains uh, uh, engineers and, uh, and windsmiths, uh, and they have as many as 80% of their graduates are veterans. And that uh, brings me to the, my second passion. As you can tell, I'm passionate about wind industry. I'm also passionate about veterans because uh, these men and women have, have uh, dedicated so much of their lives to our country. They come back here, and the wind industry is a perfect vehicle because it's a, it's a way for them to transfer their incredible skills that they've learned in managing huge uh, pieces of equipment and managing big projects uh, and going out there in difficult conditions and making things happen. Uh, the wind industry is a perfect for that uh, sort of, uh, of individual that's motivated, uh, that's well-disciplined. Uh, and we see that the industry is very good at hiring veterans. So uh, if we let this production tax credit go, we're going to see many veterans out of work. We're going to see opportunities that won't be there for veterans when they come back uh, from Iraq and Afghanistan. So there's a tremendous amount at risk. We need to make sure this production tax credit uh, is extended, uh, and it will create jobs. It'll create an industry. It'll help uh, maintain and, and grow an industry in this country. Uh, and if we don't do it, uh, as has already been mentioned, those jobs and that expertise, uh, those manufacturing plants that are right here in this country creating jobs are going to go overseas, and we're going to see the jobs and that industry go with them. It's another loss that this country cannot afford uh, in these economic times. So uh, I uh, insist that we move forward and, and uh, extend the production tax credit, and I thank my colleagues for uh, standing behind me on this issue. And I'd like to introduce my uh, colleague Stephen King from Iowa, one of the great states of wind energy production. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Um, I thank my friend Jerry and, uh, and, our, and Senators uh, uh, Grassley and Udall for their leadership on this issue, too. And when Jerry was talking about the size of the bearings being this big now, I was thinking about how small that bearing is up on that old windmill that I used to have to climb up in Greece. And uh, I didn't realize that was the time that I first began to learn something about wind, but I also learned that you don't go up there unless uh, it's a still day. And if the wind does decide to blow, there is still about 12 inches between that platform and those blades when they go around. So um, that, was, that was my first foray into wind. Wind. But I also recall when I was elected to the Iowa Senate in 96, sitting down and receiving a briefing on the proposal uh, to go forward and develop a wind industry in Iowa and in the country. And I remember that briefing. It was, um, I always want to know, what's the 15-year ROI? And if you can figure that out, then you can decide whether there's going to be an investment or not. And I remember that answer I got to that question was, well, it was, it was what are we going to have to charge for electricity to get our money back on this capital investment to do a wind turbine generation? And the answer was 15.3 cents a kilowatt. 15-year ROI, 15.3 cents. Sticks in my head like it's branded there. I've been asking that question over the last few months as we dig into renewing the production tax credit here for wind. The answer that I get back is new investments now um, with the development that we've had and the industry growing in scale, especially, is now down to around 5.2 cents. Now, you all, some of you in the room know that number better than I do. That's the reports that I'm getting. When I, when I see that and I look at my bill and it says 10.2 cents, it looks to me like we're going to get there. Um, and for those who say that it, it's never going to pan out, I have to say, look at your bill, look at this cost, now realize what happens when the industry gets stood up and it gets developed, as Senator Grassley talked about, and the industry matures. That's when the technology gets up to the point where there's not a lot more room to make those technological gains. We're approaching that point, and it's when a lot of the capital investment has been paid down. Now what's it cost without, without the cost of capital, uh, the maintenance uh, on it, and the depreciation already scored against it? We are, this, this price is going to go down yet, below that 5.2 cents. 
this is always, though, I want to emphasize a couple things, and uh, it's always been about market access. Be before I go into that, I want to express my gratitude to all of our veterans who serve this country, and we're understanding that these jobs aren't made as available to our veterans as one would think they ought to be across the board in all professions. And uh, I want to express to you that as a veteran, someone who's put on a uniform and served America and put your life on the line, that ought to at least be the tiebreaker in every job application in the United States of America. And I'm hopeful that that message goes out of here today, too. We all do appreciate you and your service, and this is a good place um, for a lot of jobs to continue to be created and a lot of jobs to be sustained. But it's been something, I think, that's been misunderstood by a lot of the people involved in a debate on wind. And the easy answer is that, that I get back in rebuttal is, well, just let it compete in the marketplace with everything else. The problem is, always with renewable energy, and we in Iowa have some experience with renewable energy, and Chuck Grassley's been deeply involved in it, it's always been market access. You could have produced free ethanol, and you couldn't have found a place to sell it or give it away because there wasn't market access. Somebody else controlled the pumps. Do the same thing with biodiesel. When you get to wind-generated electricity and you try to get it into the grid, that's a pretty tough task to do if you're just on the outside trying to compete. We had a community in my district where a philanthropist wanted to put up a wind turbine and then put that electricity into the grid for a, for a community. And when they, when they began to negotiate marks at market access, you'd think he wanted to buy down the bills of everybody in the town. And the net result after the negotiations was, we're going to charge you $40,000 more um, so just for access so that you can pump this electricity in the grid. In other words, we don't want your wind-generated electricity in our power grid. That was one location that I, that I know uh, the cir circumstances on. So this has been about market access. It's never, until you get market access, you're not going to have competition for cost. So government's got to be engaged in this to promote the market access and to provide for people to have the incentive to risk capital to develop the technology and set up the system and make the capital investment. That's really what this is about and as Congress needs to understand that we have gone forward with this, the federal government has made uh, an investment, the taxpayers have made an investment, they expect us to follow through on that investment and not pull the plug on something that is a very viable industry. And I'll just tell you, I can see, I can count at least 39 wind turbines from the seat of my lawnmower and it's been several years since I've counted. I'm sure there are even a lot more up there. And we are, I guess there's more wind in Texas and that's not a debatable point, but um, <laughs> we're doing pretty good in Iowa. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to the day that, that we see that the wind generated electricity, as clean as any energy that we have, as renewable as any energy we have, is a mature industry that has market access and can draw that capital investment outside of government incentives. I think we'll get there. We're not quite there, and I'm fully and solidly behind the production tax credit. And I want to thank all of the people that are leading on this issue and those that are helping to push us in Congress so we can get this job done. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. My name is Mike Breen. I'm the executive director of the Truman National Security Project, one of the leaders of Operation Free and an Army combat veteran. And I want to start by, on behalf of the thousands of, of Operation Free veterans across America, thanking Senators uh, Udall and Grassley, Congressman King and Congressman McNerney. Uh, it, is, it is wonderful and in the spirit of, of, I think, the service that all veterans understand to see a bipartisan, bicameral group of leaders gathered in this building to do the right thing. It's fantastic. And we're proud to stand with you and behind you. I also want to thank uh, the over 40 veterans who've come here today, M most of you work in the wind industry, who've journeyed from across the country to meet with your elected representatives. If you could all stand up if you're, if you're seated out there and be recognized, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for coming and, and for representing the thousands of veterans who've signed our petition in support of the wind production tax credit, over 500 of whom work in the wind industry. It shouldn't be a surprise that veterans are increasingly attracted to the wind and solar renewable energy industries. For many of us, it's an extension of our experiences on the ground. As a, for me, joining Operation Free was a ex direct extension of my experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan. On my first tour in Iraq as a young Army lieutenant, I served on an isolated forward operating base in a part of Iraq called the Triangle of Death. We were completely dependent at that forward operating base on generators to fuel all of our systems, from air conditioners to tactical computers. Every single day in order to fuel those generators, a fuel convoy would leave Baghdad Airport and would have to travel through heavily enemy contested territory to reach us. And every day, 
an infantry company or a platoon from my battalion would have to go out and fight to make that sure that company got in safely, that logistical convoy got in safely to fuel the generators. We called it fighting for our supper, but the supper was fossil fuel. And we lost a lot of good guys doing it. And many of us started to think there's got to be a better way. And every veteran in this room can tell a story like that. That's why the military started to orient itself toward things like tactical wind and solar systems to power forward operating bases so they're not dependent on fuel that comes from somewhere else. They can generate their power right there inside the perimeter. The wind production tax credit is about doing the same thing for America. And veterans have embraced this challenge completely. We've taken on a new industry. We've taken on new technical challenges, new business challenges, uh, really treading in the, in the footsteps that have been laid by leaders like the gentleman behind me. So we're proud to stand with you.